Jeff Bohannon. He's the founder and president of ProtoMet. He's a graduate of the University of Tennessee with a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering and a Master's in Industrial Engineering. He worked at the Y-12 nuclear weapons plant for 12 years as an engineer and project manager overseeing the manufacture of military hardware supporting projects for the Air Force, Marine, Marines, and the Navy Seawolf submarine program. After a 12-year career at Y-12, in 1997, he founded an innovative company that provides customized solutions for your on-the-water experience. Uh, the company now has a 22-year history of continued growth and three major facility expansions, providing products to various industries, including automotive, aerospace, and the military. His core business partners with the marine industry OEMs to design and manufacture premium mirrors, racks, and other leading features on today's top towboats. He also happens to be a perennial supporter of this summit. He has some great ideas and a good mindset to share with you guys. So please give a warm summit welcome to Mr. Jeff Bohannon. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Clickers up here. Hey, the pointer. Okay. Thank you, Kevin. Um, I do want to start out by saying I understand that most of these kickoff luncheons are usually the kickoff, the kickoff speaker is going to be a, some kind of author or a consultant or maybe some kind of uh, you know, well-recognized athlete. And I, before you jump to the conclusion that Kevin's just on a really tight budget this year, <laughs> I wanted to uh, share with you that there was a time um, when I was actually almost an athlete. And it was in 10th grade. And uh, I was in 10th grade health class, and you know, prior to that time, I really had never been an athlete. I played a little rec league ball, mostly during the second quarter of the game, because there was a rule that you had to put me in in the second quarter, no matter how bad I was. I got to play that quarter. Um, but uh, we got, got to 10th grade health class, the teacher walked in, she says, all right, class, uh, we're going to do a 12-minute run test. And um, I need everybody, in three weeks, uh, I need everybody to know that's, that's coming down the pike. Well, I was in class. I was the smallest person in the class. I was out of shape, believe it or not. I was actually chubby at the time. Um, I actually had a room, there was a room full of you know, football jocks. And so I was extremely intimidated. I was pretty backwards in high school, um, extremely intimidated. And she might as well have just said, if you think you might be a loser, in three weeks, we're going to give you a test, and we're going to remove all doubt. She might as well have said that. So I got home that day, and I decided the only thing I knew to do for three weeks, I was going to go start running. Okay. Now, keep in mind, this is 1978. People didn't run in 1978. So I put my shoes on, I, tennis shoes, I get out and start running. And I literally, and I'm not exaggerating this for the story, I lit literally made it to the second mailbox, and I had to start walking. And so for, for, for three weeks solid, every day after school, I went out and I ran a little bit further. I would call it something between a, a walk and a jog. I probably wouldn't call it necessarily a jog. But I was able to, at the end of the three weeks, I was able to keep going for 12 minutes. Day of the test came. I get out on the track with all my other classmates, all the jocks, and we start running. I notice a kid named Kenny takes off. He's tall and skinny. He takes off in front of everybody. So I just kind of keep my eyes on Kenny. I keep running. I'm kind of in my own world, not really paying attention to what else is going on. But I notice I never catch Kenny, but I realize nobody has passed me. And I'm like, well, I figured she must have started some other people at a different time. The 12 minutes is over. I get to the end of going around the school track. She comes over and she says, do you realize you just finished in second place? And I, I mean, I could not believe it. And she said, do you run? I said, well, for three weeks I've been running. <laughs> and, and so she said, well, you know, you should maybe consider being on the track team. So I, you know, I took that as a great honor. I mean, I literally never considered myself an athlete, certainly never qualified for kind of high school athletics. I know a lot of, there's a lot of natural athletes in here. Some of you may have a hard time even relating to that. But I would have never thought myself to be a high school athlete. So I went and trained all summer long, came back to, to be part of the high school track team, got started training with the guys. There was four guys, three guys on our team that could run a mile in less than four and a half minutes. And so that was pretty unusual for back then. Usually you'd be lucky to have one person. So I lined up at the very first race with those three guys on the front of the pack. And I just thought, well, I'll just do what they do. So I took off running and for about 200 yards ran with those three guys. And then one of them looked over to me and he said, Bohannon, what are you doing? 
And I didn't really have an answer, but I realized why he was asking me that, because it began to implode. And by the time I got to the finish line, they were literally taking the cones up uh, from the finish of the race, uh, which is a little bit disrespectful, but you know, I understand some of them wanted to probably go home. Today I want to talk about, you know, that was a day of dramatic change. The day she came, you know, came into that health class was a day of dramatic change for me. Um, I actually did continue to run track the rest of that year. And actually, I didn't ever win a race, but I got a lot better. And, you know, I was, you know, went from being chubby, out of shape, to running six, 12 miles a day it was a total transformation in my body. And, you know, I asked myself, why did I change? Was I, was I transformed by change or was I transformed by my reaction to change? And, you know, our world, it, we're in a world of increasing change, and that's what I want to talk about today. Because this accelerated change is a great opportunity for us, but a lot of people are, we're all wired to resist change. We have a long history, the human race has a long history of pretty static, pretty minimal change, and I don't think a lot of us don't even realize how recent the dramatic changes have started happening. And I want to just share some slides to illustrate that. Um, if you look at the last 200 years, uh, we have gone from riding a horse at eight miles an hour, average speed for 20 miles of a horse, I googled that, which you couldn't do until the late 2000s, uh, up to a, a jet, which travels average speed of 550 to 600 miles, which, if you do the math between that number and the horse speed, that's about a 78, 70x improvement in travel speeds, which is pretty incredible if you think about it. And in fact, um, you know, I didn't put rockets on here because most people don't fly around in rockets, but we've actually got rocket technology. Um, but to that point, um, you know, a lot of people in my grandparents' generation, they don't even, they, there's a high percentage of those people that do not believe we actually went to the moon. And the reason they don't is because they started their childhood on, on horses and they ended up seeing on TV us being on the moon. That is so much change in a lifetime that some people have their you know, hard time getting their head around it. To just give that some perspective, if you go back 5,000 years, we've been on a horse for 5,000 years, and literally 200 years ago, we got off the horse. Pretty incredible when you think about the history of our modern world and, our, and what we've seen in the last 200 years. So 200 versus 4,800. I came across this concept as I was researching the talk about change. There's a guy named Peter Till. He co-founded uh, PayPal with Elon Musk. And he's a really uh, brilliant thought leader in this area of change. And he talks about, you know, he talks, he kind of divides change into two parts. He talks about fit, things that are physical that have changed. Uh, everything basically in this room is made of atoms. So that's what I'm talking about in the physical world. And then there's the digital world. In the digital world, which is governed by computers, there's a guy named uh, Gordon Moore, uh, co-founded Intel in 1965. He predicted that for the next 10 years, that computers would double in speed, and they would uh, roughly every 18 months, and they would cost half as much. And his prediction actually turned out to be correct. And what happened is, by that prediction, if you do that for, if you do the math for 10 years, that's actually 100x improvement in the speed of computers, which already passes up the physical world of travel, 100x speed in computers in 10 years. But he was pretty prescient when he said that because his same, what became to, known as Moore's Law continued for another 40 years. And so computers have continued to double at a rate uh, every 18 months to two years, such that now computers, an, a standalone computer, is on average 100 million times faster than a computer in 1965. And that is exponentially magnified when you look at the software that we now have that hooks these computers together and, and, and has that interconnectivity. Basically, computers today are infinitely more powerful than the computers we had in 1965. That opens up some interesting opportunities. Um, one of the things that's interesting as far as when you look at change, and I think most of us are concerned about what change can do to us, because change can disrupt our industry. And one of the ways that you can assess the potential for change to disrupt what you're doing is when something that's done currently in the physical world jumps across to the digital world, there's this huge increase in the rate of speed that it can happen. 
And so if you think about, if you think logically about this, I know a lot of us were probably surprised at how quickly Uber and Lyft came on the market and it completely disrupted the taxi industry. But if you just use this thinking model to evaluate that, the analog signal of raising your hand to wave down a tag, uh, to wave down a taxi, jumped across to the digital world of holding out my smartphone and clicking I want a taxi ride. Right? So we moved from the physical world to the digital world and, and, in, and increased the, uh, the disruption of the taxi industry. 2007 is a pretty special year in the digital world. That is when the iPhone was released, um, Facebook became mainstream, it came out of the colleges and the high schools, and PayPal uh, actually started in the early 2000s. And so that facilitated you know, secure payments, um, the five-star rating system was kind of popularized by some apps. With the, with the iPhone being out and pushing the state of the art with the smartphones, you know, the whole world, app world started up. Keep in mind, 2007 was only 13 years ago. And, and keep in mind uh, things like Airbnb that started in 2008 and now has more lodging than all other uh, hotels combined could not have started until 2008. So these changes are not things that we could have even learned about in our school systems. In fact, the school systems are so far behind this. And so we have to continually be learning how to incorporate this change into our everyday lives. A guy named Astro Teller uh, is the leading research guy at Google. He's in charge of keeping Google on the cutting edge of technology. Right, and his great grandfather was actually the uh, guy that kind of oversaw some of the Manhattan Project that happened in our city with regards to building the nuclear weapons. So he is a very Astro Teller is a very intelligent human being, and he drew this chart recently. He said technology is on this exponential curve, and the problem is that our human adaptability is on a it's on a slight curve, but it's a much less steep curve. It's almost a line. He said, humans adapt to change linearly, whereas technology is changing exponentially. He said, somewhere between the year 2007, which is when the iPhone came out, and the year 2016, those lines crossed. We can no longer keep up with the change that is coming at us. He said that that number of of having to adapt to significant change has reduced from 500 years ago, it took about 100 years before significant change would happen that humans would need to adapt. Within, well, by the time of the 19th, uh, 20th century, 1900 rolled, he said it would take 20 to 30 years for humans to have to adapt to a major change. He now says five to seven years, major change is happening and we need to be adapting to it in real time. The way he illustrates real time is kind of uh, dear to my heart. He uses a bicycle analogy, and I'm, I'm kind of a big road, gotten into road biking in the last three years, and that's kind of my athletic form now. It's, it's something you can do when you're my age. It doesn't hurt your knees. But I've, um, he talks about the importance of when you ride a bike, and, and this is not news to anybody, when you ride a bike, you've got to stay in motion, right? It's very hard to stand up on a bike if you're not in motion. And he said, we now have to assume a state of perpetual motion with regards to keeping in touch with the latest changes and incorporating those into our industry. <clears throat> our ability to incorporate change is largely based on how we interact with change, how we address change, and our mindset is largely what drives that. Um, we have a long history in this nation of scarcity. Um, we, we are, uh, for many years, largely an uh, agricultural economy. And it's very difficult to multiply your wealth when you're basically on a farm and you're just doing ag, you know, the old school way. Um, technology, recent technology that has come about is really recent history is the first chance that, a nor that just the average person could really multiply their wealth. And so there's a lot of huge opportunities uh, regarding incorporating technology, but it, but it has to come with an abundance mindset. I want to talk a little about um, our industry. Um, we have a metric in the industry that we largely reference um, uh, called market share. I think most of us are, are familiar with that. This number at the top, the 13,600, represents a number that I was given kind of as the high water mark 
uh, for our industry, for kind of where we've got. Now, I realize that we're in here talking about toad sports, toad water sports, and I realize there's a lot, you know, there's pontoons and there's jet boats and others that are not included in this number, but I kind of want to just use this number as a point of reference, if you'll work, if you'll work with me on this. Um, you know, when we talk about uh, market share, we talk about a, in percentages typically. So if I've got a 1% market share at a, at a number of 13,600, uh, what, would, what would that be? Anybody? 136, right? Take the two zeros off, get to 136. If I gain 1% market share and that number at the top does not change, what has to happen? Some, somebody else has to lose part of the market share, right? So this, this uh, market share model is, uh, is considered you know, a scarcity-based model. It's, it's kind of zero-sum thinking. The, the top number's fixed, and we're dividing up the market share. I know that there's 200 and something people in this room, and I looked at the attendee list, and we represent a very wide, diverse sector of the industry. There's probably 12 different subgroups in this room, everybody from media to OEMs to suppliers to dealers uh, to the industry representatives, um, just on and on, insurance guys, legal people. Everybody here is here for the purpose of supporting and growing the industry, right? We're talking about that growing the industry. Larry and Kevin have done a great job over these last decade and a half, two decades, of building up this organization in a way that has encouraged a, a very wide and diverse group of participation. And so the interesting thing is with all this new technology, we have the opportunity to, to really engage our customers at a new level. We have the, the opportunity to really give customers exposure in new ways because of social media and because of what happened in 2007 with the, with the introduction of some of that technology. The problem is when, we, uh, when we focus on market share, um, the problem is I was, I was actually, just as an example, I was at the Porsche Experience Center uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, actually, uh, Andrew, Matt, and I went down there because we're kind of looking at Porsche as a, as, a, as a pretty progressive company that's done some really cool stuff outside, you know, outside of the marine industry, obviously, just to get some ideas about how to engage customers. They have these experience centers down there that where they, you can pay to go drive a Porsche on one of their six, or, well, on all of their test tracks. Um, they have six different test tracks. Um, the one I was most intrigued with um, was the drift track which was polished concrete, big circle, and I really, uh, we, we got to try all the tracks out, but when I got on the drift track, I think I about made my coach sick trying to get 360 around the drift track with that Porsche. And I was really having trouble spinning out, and he said, dude, he said, you're, you're gonna have to chill out a little bit, you're gonna have to calm down. Uh, he said something about type A personality, and I said, do you really think I'm type A? He said, oh, yeah. So, so anyway, we had spent 20, 30 minutes trying to get around this track, and. Um, and so he finally just said, look, he said, do you ski? And I said, yeah, a little bit. And he said, he said, do you ski through trees? I said, well, sometimes. He said, what do you look at? And I said, well, I know I'm not supposed to look at the trees. I'm supposed to look at the path between the trees. He said, exactly. He said, whatever you look at, that's the way you're going to go. And I was turning my head, and the back of the car was spinning around because it was drifting toward the grass. And he said, if we went in the grass, we had to take the car back in for inspection. I knew that would be very embarrassing. So I was trying to keep the car out of the grass. But I was reacting and I wasn't focusing on where I was needing to go. The problem with a focus just on market share, and I understand I'm not dogging that metric, I understand it's a metric we have to track, but, the, but the, the, the downside of just focusing on market share is that we're dealing in what's called the red ocean. And you know, there's a book called Blue Ocean Strategy um, that talks about getting out in, you know, expanding your horizons out beyond the, the red, the bloody ocean of competition. And if we play just in this little market share pie, we're going to spend all of our time beating each other up on features and benefits and not looking at opportunities to grow outside of that. So how do we, how do we get outside of our heads to, to look at other industries? There's a book out now called Range, written by a guy named David Epstein, and he talks about the um, 10,000 hour rule. You've, you've probably heard of it. It's cited, Tiger Woods has cited a lot. If you want to get really good at a particular uh, discipline, you need 10,000 hours of focused practice. And he said, you know, the problem with that theory is, uh, and using like golf as an example, is golf is one of those sports when you hit the ball, um, there's a very predictable result, right? Now, when I hit the ball, it's very unpredictable, but that has to do with the unpredictable input. 
If you can engage the ball with a predictable uh, angle of attack, that ball is going to go in a pretty predictable uh, trajectory. Um, that is what he called a kind learning environment. And that is not the, the environment that we, that we operate in in the business world. He talked about, he used musicians as an example. He said, musicians who play, and you probably know an example of this in your own personal lives, but mus musicians who play multiple instruments can generally accomplish a higher level of competence in, in one of those instruments because of that exposure to multiple instruments. They are observing principles across all the musical instruments and that allows them to be more creative and innovative and improvise at a very high level when it comes to playing the one instrument that they might specialize in. This is, this is also true of, of Nobel Prize winning scientists. They've observed that Nobel Prize winning scientists who have reached the very highest levels of academia always have an avocation that's outside of their main area of expertise where they spend time doing research or, or maybe just a hobby. So it's really important to get outside of our industry and look at other industries as an example. I mentioned Porsche, the Porsche Experience Center. You know, a couple of things happened when I was down at Porsche. We paid for that experience, so it's a revenue stream for Porsche, right? Porsche, in 1992, was on the ropes. They were just about to go out of business. Um, they got down to a volume of 15,000 cars per year you know, worldwide. And they have reinvented their company. They've reinvented the operations. They've reinvented how they approach the customer. This is where the experience center concept came from. And they have now grown their uh, total volume. Uh, worldwide sales of the Porsche have grown to 300,000. So they've 20 x the size of their company by re-engaging how they approach their customer and re-engaging how they approach their operations. They've, you, you know, I mean, you've seen Porsches on the road. They're, they've really expanded the market. Um, and the thing, you know, a couple things that happened while I was down there at the Porsche Ex Experience Center, which I think are relevant to the marine industry, is for, for one thing, you know, it's, it's, it's de definitely different than a boat demo. Um, there was no pressure, I mean, there was no even perceived pressure that I was going to buy a Porsche, right? So I went down there for just the experience, and I paid for that. Um, so the coach that was with me, he spent no time trying to sell me on features and benefits of that Porsche. What he wanted to sell me on was what it could do, right? So he got me over the hurdle of feeling intimidated by, dri by driving a very powerful 911 type high performance sports car. And he made me do things, he told me to do things in that Porsche that I would have never done on my own, right? He, there was one stretch where he told me to slam the accelerator, go as hard as I could toward this basically block wall, and then he was gonna tell me when to slam the brake on, and I was to slam it as hard as I could and stop. And we're going along and I'm thinking, I'd tell me to stop right now, right now, right now. And so finally he'd say, go, and so I'd slam it. I'd wasted no time getting it. I don't know how those guys even do that. But he got me comfortable being in a Porsche, right? And so I think, you know, most people uh, in this room, a lot of you grew up in the, in, the, in the industry. You grew up on the water. I think it, it might be fair to say you might just take it for granted at how comfortable uh, you might feel growing up on the water. And I can say this coming from a different perspective. I didn't grow up on the water. I got up my first boat in 2008 when we started doing stuff for the marine industry, and I used it as a way to take my family out. And, you know, the one big advantage uh, for a boat, and Andrew, Andrew Jenkins and I were talking about this the other day, you know, when you go out on a boat, and I've always had a boat that had 16-person capacity because my wife is very much a people person, and we had to invite everybody. We always had one or two families with us, and I've been on a boat every summer, every Saturday, that we didn't have something else planned since 2008 with my family. There's not a single sport, whether it be on a Porsche or go play golf, or do any other sport that I know of that you can engage your family the way I engage my family on my boat. And it's a huge value proposition that we take for granted, but there's this barrier that I would have, I would have, had I not started making parts for the marine industry, I probably would not be in a wakeboard boat. That's just, that's just the reality. I would have never been exposed. So I think there's a huge opportunity to get into this blue ocean by thinking differently about how we approach our customers. In, the game, in life, there are a couple different kind, types of uh, uh, games. Um, there's a finite game, and there's an infinite game. The finite game 
A good example of a finite game is the game of football. In the finite game of football, you have rules, you have a way to keep score, uh, we have a certain number of players, we have a certain time limit on the game. When the game is over, we declare a winner. Okay, and so that and it's all it's a voluntary game. It's you know, it's it, it is what it is um, In the game of life, there's also uh, Infinite games for example life itself is an infinite game um, We don't win the game of life, right? Um, careers we don't win our careers. We may win a promotion But we don't win our careers um, if we look at marriage Mar you know, nobody wins at marriage, right? Now, my wife would tell you that she's winning, but she just wins most of the battles. We are, we're still at war, I would tell you. No, I'm just kidding. My wife, she is, she is and she's going to get a copy of this video, so I've got to, I've got to correct this. You know, she is an awesome uh, woman, uh, and she has put up with me for over 30 years, and I would call that experience uh, a journey. And you know, we've been on this journey together. It's a very rich journey. Um, and we've not always seen eye to eye, but we've managed to hold it together for over 30 years. And you know, one thing that's, that's common to all infinite games is that, is, that, um, is that they are journeys. They're not events. A football game is an event. A, uh, the game of business is an infinite game. And the rule, the main focus in an infinite game is to playing to stay in the game. That's the whole purpose of playing an infinite game is to stay in the game. We have to focus on that. So if you think about it, in the game of football, there's this thing called the onside kick. The onside kick, from a statistical perspective, only makes sense to ever call for an onside kick in a game where there's a predefined time limit, right? Because statistically speaking, the odds are so low of an onside kick working, you would never bring that to an infinite game. The problem is we have a, fi a lot of finite-minded business leaders who bring a finite-minded mentality to the infinite game of business. And we're going to go through this little process where you say, all right, here's where we are now, and we're going to take this thing 10x. And you might, ask, you might say, well, why not? You know, why would you not do 2x? Well, 2x is actually harder than 10x. It's too hard. Uh, because when you do t something 2x, you're tempted to just work harder. You're tempted to try to kind of look within yourself to try to kind of figure it out. You try to, you know, you're going to try to connect the dots to make it happen. So it's easier to think 10x because you cannot do that. We cannot do that ourselves. So why would, okay, so using that logic, why would you not just say, well, let's just do 100x then? Well, 100x is, is too big. Uh, it's not, you can't get your head around that at all. And so it's just too unrealistic. So why 10x? In the world of product innovation, there's this principle that if a product is 10x better than an existing product, it will, by definition, disrupt the existing product. If a product is only 2x better, it's very, if there's a lot of brand loyalty with the existing product, it might not disrupt. But if it's 10x better, it will, by definition, disrupt that product. So what we want to do by going 10x is we want to, we want to disrupt ourselves, right? We want, we want to have to get outside of our headspace to figure out how to get 10x. In the early days of starting our company, um, it's, it's easy to think about playing with an infinite mindset because when you start a company, you have no resource, you may have no resources, and you've got to play the game to stay in the game. If you don't play the game to stay in the game, you're probably not going to survive. And so um, when we started our company, we had an opportunity to look at a large automotive contract. We managed to get that contract using a, basically a PowerPoint presentation with Mercedes um, to show how we were going to make a part for their seatbelt system. The only problem was we didn't have machine tools, we didn't have a, a facility, we didn't have employees, and we didn't have a stamping capability that was required to make this part. But that was actually, I didn't realize it at the time, but that was to, to our advantage because it forced us to get outside of our capabilities to figure out how we were going to get this project done. We didn't tell the customer that we didn't have all that. We just said, we'll get it done. And, you know, I kind of almost cautious to say that in front of all my customers out here because it's like, what else did not tell me? But, um, but uh, 
we continued to grow the company with that. We 10 x it in about seven years. We continued to grow, and that's when I came across, actually came across this process with a business coach who showed us that, said, look, if you'll go through this template process, this helps you get out, you know, uh, outside of yourself. And you know, one of the things I've had to learn since starting our company was I try to do everything myself, and then you, you try to delegate, and you, you, you hire other people, and you have sometimes you don't make the right hires, and you, know, and you, and you just kind of get caught up in this whirlwind, and so it's very difficult to keep your head above. And he said, you know, you really have to uh, you know, get out of your own headspace to really make this happen. And um, in fact, you know, Matt Reed uh, works, works for us as a director of engineering. He, you know, he doesn't give out many compliments, but I took this one as a compliment one time. He said, Jeff's finally figured out how to get out of his own way. And so there's a lot of truth to, um, to us knowing how to get out of our own way so that we can make things happen. So we just actually went through this process um, this last year with our team, uh, sitting around and said, all right, we're going to 10x this thing. And there's, there just happened to be 10 people in the room. I said, look, guys, if we go 10x, each person in the room is going to have to be responsible for a division that's as large as where we are as the entire company. And so that's kind of, you know, trying to empower people to think, you know, how are we going to do that? It's really about establishing a bigger future. And, you know, when you're my age, um, at my season in life, it's really important that I don't start thinking about tapering off if I'm continuing to leave my business. I've got to be continuing to persist, persist push us for exponential growth. And so that's part, of, that's part of why this process is the way it is. It's pushing for the bigger future because as soon as I start tapering off, then my past becomes bigger than my future and that's not a good place to be when we're trying to lead a company. Quickly, I'm not going to go through the template, but this is the template that we actually use to go through. You define a, a starting year and an ending year and you kind of develop it. You divide it up into five stages and you, you identify key changes that need to happen. Um, you ask, well, what, you know, what timeline do you use to, you know, to 10x your company? I said, well, if you have an infinite mindset, you know, it doesn't really matter. But if you, if you were to use 15 years, that would be somewhere between 15 and 18% growth for consistently 15 years. You say, well, I can't do that every year. Well, I know you can't do it every year. We've not done it every year. And, but but uh, one good principle to remember is I learned from a, a famous goal-setting author, Brian Tracy. He said, we can always do... More, less in one year than we think we can, but we can always do more in five years than we think we can. So you don't necessarily get a certain specific level of progression every year, but when you think in chunks of what capabilities have to happen, uh, then you can do that. One of the things we do is we go backwards through the process first, and we look at where we are now, and we look at where we've come from, because some of us have a hard time thinking that we can go 10x, but if we think backwards, we know that we've 10 x where we were at one point, right? We've grown our knowledge, our physical capability, our mental capabilities, uh, 10x. Um, it's, it's really more about who, finding the who's, not how to get something done, and that's the difference in this and delegation. We typically delegate down, but we who up, and we try to find people perhaps outside of our company, strategic suppliers, uh, people that we can partner with. We lean on our machine tool guys, we lean on our cutting tool guys, our suppliers to help us leverage their capabilities to help us stay on the cutting edge. We don't have time at the rate of change is happening, we don't have time to make that happen inside of our company. So the key is teamwork and technology. To sum it up, exponential change is here. It's here as of 2007, really. Um, it started before then, but in 2007, there were so many things that happened to empower us to, uh, to make exponential improvements in the way we run our business and to engage our customers in ways that we've never engaged them before. Um, I want to close. All right, I'm, I am out of time, so I'll, I'll close with that. And I do appreciate, appreciate you letting me have this chance to share with the industry. Let's go have a great conference. Thank you. Keep it going for Jeff, everybody. That was awesome. Uh, I want to thank both of our speakers, Jeff and uh, Karen. Um, we've got some sessions coming up here. Kev's going to talk about that.